There are amazing founders that are not, that don't build good businesses, right? There's a lot of people that tries to build things so that at the end they find the problem and should be the other way around. It's, we have this problem, how are we going to fix it? This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts, this is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, disruptors, and creators who are making things happen. My name is Michael T. Johnson, and I'm here with Tyler Kelly. And tonight we're at Venture Cafe Miami, Venture Cafe being the largest gathering of entrepreneurs anywhere in the world. So on a Thursday evening, if you're near Venture Cafe, I suggest you go check it out. Uh, Also tonight, I'm very excited because we have Laura Gonzalez Estefani. Laura, thank you for being with us. Thank you guys for the invitation. So Laura is the founder and CEO of The Venture City, which is a new business acceleration and growth model that helps diverse founders achieve global impact. Correct. Also a mother of three children and a dog. Exactly. And you've been, you were with Facebook and eBay and Siemens and Ogilvy. Yes. And I mean, just amazing experiences. And I'm 43, by the way. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we, we have to talk about all that. You're also involved with WinLab. Yes. Here in Miami and recently appointed as a member of the European Innovation Council, which is a group of 22 experts that lead the future of the region from a scientific, technological and business point of view. So yes. lots to talk about. With the European Commission. Yes. There I am. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where to jump in with all that, but let's start with Venture City because I've heard people talk about yes. excited Everywhere we go we hear about Venture so, City. so yes. we want to know where it came from yes what's it all about so um i've been working in tech for more than 20 years now i have been very successful at times and terribly unsuccessful at others so when i was i lived in silicon valley many years and when i was there i realized that not always the best entrepreneurs get the funding or the opportunities uh, basically, talent is universal, but opportunity is not, right? So being from Spain, a woman immigrant in the U.S., and being able to meet so many entrepreneurs from all over the world, I was like, whoa, there's a huge gap here. What can we do to fix this problem? In parallel, we were already seeing that Silicon Valley was not anymore what it used to be. I mean, it's, it's the Mecca in very many ways. But it's, there are so many emerging tech hubs all over the world, in Europe, in, in Latin America, and of course Asia, and, and even in Africa, Nigeria, or Kenya, where a lot of amazing things are happening. So I said, you know what, maybe this is my time to go back to building my own thing and uh, go back to entrepreneurship, which I wasn't, I hadn't been successful in the past. But anyway, you know, I, I, I don't like to say that I was in my middle age, middle age crisis, but I was certainly 40 years old when that happened. And so I met my co-founder and uh, together we said, you know what, let's, let's try to change this. So at the end, what we're trying to do is, no matter where founders, with good founders, with good products and big impact, impact but making money obviously are, that we want to support them. I know that maybe because I am, I've worked in so many places all around the globe, um, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of having an office in San Paolo, in San Francisco, in El Salvador, and in Madrid. A lot of people thought in the very beginning that we were a little bit unfocused, but it also, it all responds to a strategy of, Latin America is rising, it's been rising already for many years, the amazing uh, entrepreneurs and, and investors down there. And now with um, SoftBank even more, we're starting to see so many unicorns finally in the region. Also in Europe, amazing things are happening in places like Lisbon or Madrid, Barcelona, Paris. So there's, there's a huge momentum, right? And because we are a crazy team of people that has worked for big companies when they were startups we have that you know stamina that says yeah i need to contribute to this somehow and i need to make a business out of it and that's what basically you know that's how it, everything evolved to to the venture city right so we invest in companies average ticket is 1.5 million but we also have a very interesting growth uh, accelerator program, very based on data. 
uh, where we invest 100K. So it's we have both worlds, the ones that are already making it and the ones that are just baking it. Um, so yes, so that's what wakes me up every morning, the Venture City. So when we talk about like an early stage ecosystem, which Miami is, is kind of still early stage in terms of like innovation and, and yeah. startups, would you yes. agree? Like what are some of the similarities that you see among like the business startups and how might that change? Because you, yes. you've been all over the world yes. as Miami matures. Yes. So I would like to, to divide the question in two. So one is that we do have companies all over the world and, and we invested in Silicon Valley, in Boston, New York, Sao Paulo, Madrid, London, etc. cetera. Uh, why we chose Miami, it's because two reasons. One is because we're builders. We love to build from scratch. We really roll up our sleeves and we love to be part of companies from the very beginning. Now, at the same time, Miami's amazing population makes it very unique. I think it's the only place in the world where two languages are spoken as well, mixed at the same time, that's one. Which means that people understand two cultures, the Hispanic culture at the same time as the American culture, which is not very easy. Talking about diversity is easy, but practicing it, oh my goodness, it's so complex, right? It, I would also add that because of its location and because it's a it's a city built by entrepreneurs and immigrants you know there's 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 always someone available to talk to you there's someone available to open your eyes if you're too stubborn you not wanting to see things there's a, there's there's a something here that makes it very unique but at the same time it's very early stages very very early stages we have i think there's already like eight or nine unicorns but Many of them have been baking for over 10 years. So we don't have that kind of unicorn that has been built in five years. We don't have that. Or maybe there's one, but well, my chewy, I don't know. I, I don't really know, honestly. But, but we wanted to be part of that. And um, from here, we take care of companies in the West Coast, in Latin America, startups from Latin America come here, founders from the West Coast come here, from Europe. It's really a very strategic, geographic uh, place. And until I get deported, if I ever get deported, we will be putting our energy and passion here. Tell me about some of the success stories or, or at least like some progress you've made with, yes. with uh, what you're doing. Oh yeah, sure. So we have 19 companies in the fund. Average ticket is 1.5. We have over 20% of the businesses in FinTech, in Brazil, in Silicon Valley, in Spain. We have invested in, we were the first institutional investor in Boat Setter, which is one of the, I would say, most interesting businesses by far in the East Coast of the United States. And there's a lady leading, uh, Jacqueline. She's one of the uh, founders and CEO. Um, we have other, we have 25 companies in our growth accelerator, companies that are in Peru. Peru, Chile, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Uruguay, Madrid, Lisbon, London, you name it, Miami, of course, 25. And we have uh, really, the mix would be marketplaces, 30%, SaaS, like a business model, but also B2B would be around maybe 40%. And then we do, as I said, a lot of FinTech and um, mobility. We have a unicorn in our portfolio, which is Gabify, which is the largest uh, trans, I would say, I don't know, ride sharing, whatever we want to call it. There are so many names in Spanish speaking countries. So that's so far two years. We are 33 people from 17 different nationalities. Over 50% are women in leadership positions. Um, my co founder, Clara, is from Argentina. I am from Madrid, Spain. Um, yeah. So we're in our 40s. I mean, we have all the checks, like, to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you say unicorn, tell me what you mean by unicorn. Well, you know what? I have my own uh, way of calling successful companies, which is iguana corns. And this is something that came out from my mouth like three years ago as part of Emerge Americas. Iguana corns for me are those founders that have built amazing businesses with businesses, not only making impact, but really truly businesses uh, that are over a thousand, uh, a billion dollars, but um, 
but that are still private, it's more or less. And they are and they belong to the Hispanic world, more or less, like Latin America, to some extent Europe, etc. So iguana corns for me are are truly amazing people, very hustlers that have built empires with a third of the opportunities that are giving to unicorns in San Francisco or Miami. Uh, and we also have if, if you if you Google iguana corn, you will see our iguana corn. We have the everything, the the design and everything. So that's that's what I'm in love with iguana corns. <laughs> so let me dig into that a little bit more for the people out there listening. Like, what makes a let's let's do this three different ways. Yes. What what's a good what makes a good idea? What yes. makes a good founder? Yes. And then what makes a good business? Okay, I don't believe in ideas. Simple. I believe in execution. So you can have brilliant ideas, but you you cannot be able to make that a reality. So ideas out of my box. I don't invest that early either. I've always invested in companies with traction, with teams that are amazing, hard workers and executors. What makes a good founder is first being a good person, right? Being a good person means be, being willing to listen, being willing to learn even in the hard times, being willing to share with other members of your team and staff, um, and obviously having a clear vision and focus. Focus, okay, this is the understanding the problem you're trying to solve basically, getting the numbers behind that and focusing and getting the energy and, and, and focusing the energy into solving that thing, right, that, that particular problem. Uh, and what was the last, what makes a big, a big business? business. So there are amazing founders that are not that don't build good businesses, right? Um, at the end, the business is, is really if there's a product market fit. I think that one thing that we talked a, a lot inside our team is like, is this founder trying to create a problem, or is he solving a problem? And there are a lot of founders, the ones that don't build successful businesses, that don't get to do it because there wasn't really a problem. You know, there's a lot of people that tries to build things so that at the end they find the problem and should be the other way around. It's, we have this problem, how are we going to fix it, right? So for me, the good founders that have been able to build big businesses are the ones that very early on talk to the people, to the potential customers, did amazing research, run a few pilots and identify there's a true problem here I'm going to fix it. So for example, with the Venture City, as I was saying, I've been more than 20 years in tech and I have felt myself the lack of opportunity. You know, like, why, what the hell? Because I'm from Spain, whatever. We weren't able to raise money back in 2000 when we needed it. And the idea was brilliant, by the way. But anyway, so once you understand that you've been getting to that problem on and on around your career for so many years in so many places, you know, I've, do, I've done my personal research on it. And uh, before jumping into everything, I knew I had already a lot of businesses that would, love, that would love to get invested by us and a lot of companies that would love to be accelerated by us. So that's, that type of homework is what you need to do before to guarantee a good business. You mentioned, you mentioned something about good founders that never have a good business. Yes. That seems interesting to me. Yes, yes. There's a lot of people, there's extremely well-prepared founders that are coming from amazing schools and consultancy firm, firms and things like that, that running a business is very tough. I mean, every time you see a founder, hats off 20 times. You know, getting your hands into the nitty-gritty every day, solving conti Founders only have problems. You only have problems to solve. That's, you know. Um, and sometimes this type of people that are really good, prepared founders don't, don't, don't understand how to run the business. And on the other side, there's amazing people with no education, with no, but that understand what's out there, that have seen, that have tested, that have talked to customers that build amazing uh, businesses. I mean, this is very general, right? But it happens. I, I think I was a great co-founder in 1999, but I wasn't able to build a good business out of it, you know? Um, 
And I know so many other stories of people that being great founders weren't able to get to the last mile. And I still today have to prove a lot. My business has two years only. So uh, let's see what happens. Like, you will interview me five years from now and see where we are. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, um, that's, the, that's the thinking behind it. Well, what, what is it? Because I, I think from any, anybody who's in a, in a business, running a business, yes. wants to know what the answer to that question is. If that business doesn't make it, what is it that those founders do, do or aren't doing? You reinvent yourself. Oh, you mean from what you aren't question. doing? Oh, from the last question. What normally they are not doing is listening. A lot of people take decisions based on intuition and they don't take decisions based on facts. Number one, super important, there's so much data available nowadays that there's no excuse. You can have a little bit of intuition, of course, like you (gasps) take the plunge, but then you need to have the data behind it to say, okay, I'm going in the right direction or not. There's people that are not doing their homework. That's number one. The number two is that they don't hire the right people. It's super hard managing people. And startups evolve very, very fast. You need to make sure that you're hiring the people that is going to like a chameleon, going to be able to change their skin to whatever is happening. Um, Three, it's very normal that companies pivot. And there's people that insist to keep on doing what they're doing no matter what, and then the competitors go the other way around, right? So there are different things that founders that are not successful are doing. For me, the most critical is listening and listening to your peers, listening to your investors, listening to the market. One of the things that I am happy to see is that it looks like the most successful tech companies are the ones that understand the customer the best. You see, and I hate to see where banks are going and where so many traditional industries are going because they're not listening. How come my bank gives me, that I've been within my bank 10 years, worst conditions for a loan than to someone that is just new to the bank. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. yeah. So, and, 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 and there's so much opportunity in so many different spaces where the people that are building those businesses understand that from the customer point of view. And I'm very excited to be part of that trend. So let's switch gears and talk about all of the things that you're doing and how that reflects on Miami, not necessarily yes. your personal work, yes. but like the organization. So like WinLab and Endeavor and then the European Innovation Council, like yeah. all of these things. Just A lot more than that, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So one of the, one of the pillars of our success is community. Uh, one of the things that both my co-founder and myself, uh, my co-founder comes from the banking space and she she thought that it was very needed to educate the financial world into what investing in technology means because it's a very risky asset and most of them run away from it, right? Um, and on my side, I really wanted to educate those, those, entrepre- those potential entrepreneurs and those that are already building companies about what, what are the not to do's. So there's a huge piece of giving back from the very beginning where we've hosted I think that in these two years, we've, we've trained over 5,000 or 6,000 people in, in all the locations, in small groups of 25 to 50 people in different areas from data, but not data analytics, but from building a business based on data to how to run your finances to how to build so many different things, your, your, your full stack, whatever, from the engineering point of view, right? So that is, that, is, that is one of the things that we've done from the very beginning. And this is why we have you know, we have collaborated with so many organizations and the Venture City is always in all our campuses an open space for anyone that wants to help and give back the community, right? Um, we are very picky. Not everyone, li- like me, if you're going to be talking about, if it's going to be a commercial session, don't, don't, we're not, you're not going to be using the Venture City for that. Or if you're going to be training in something that we think adds value to the community, we won't. We don't think that's that's uh, the, the venture city is the place for that, but anything related to engineering, product, uh, data, uh, from the data mindset piece to transforming businesses into embracing whatever comes in, those are things that we do a lot. Um, we have pizza days, we have beer days, we have paella days, we have a lot of different things. Um, but yes, community is one of the key pillars of the venture city. When you asked me before about Miami. Um, as I was saying, I have people in the office from Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Paraguay, Russia, 
uh, United States, Spain, London, Italy. In, it's, it's like the United Nations in wow. Little Havana uh, and in Madrid because we have both types of teams in both places. So if somebody wants, you know, they have a business, they're, they're a founder and, and they're starting to get some traction with, with their business uh, and they want to try to get your attention, do you seek businesses out or do they apply with the Venture City? No, no of course. Like? What I love, I mean, one of the things that I enjoy the most is talking to founders and understanding what they're up to. So they can always reach out to us through any of the channels where we are, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the website, LinkedIn, whatever. We would always be open to hear. The only thing is that we don't do hardware because we don't understand hardware and manufacturing processes. So those that have hardware businesses, I'm very sorry we can't help. If anything else that is software-based and that has at least six months of traction, with at least double digit growth in terms of product adoption, not revenues. I'm not looking for companies in early stage that are making revenues. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for companies that have massive people adoption. That's what I'm looking for. Um, so they can reach out to us in any format or they can swing by any of our campuses and we would be more than happy to listen to them. And if we are not the right fit because I don't know, whatever, we can always point them to someone else that we know that will be able to help them. In fact, this is something interesting. I hate when people gives you an empty no. You know, fundraise, having had to fundraise myself, I think is such a lack of respect when a potential investor says no, but okay, but no, why? Why no? Give me a something. I need to learn from all this process, you know? So we always say no, because of this and that and that. Maybe you can do things better by ping, ping, ping. And maybe if you talk to these other guys, they can be of help to you, right? So we, we try to avoid empty no's because we, ah, it breaks your heart when you get one of those, right? And at the same time, with all these educational sessions that we do in campus that anyone can join there for free, anyone can join. Um, we teach them and how to come, you know, how to transform a no in a potential yes, because sometimes it's a no in that moment, but if you come back six months later or a year later, oh, maybe you really, uh, you know, you found the iceberg and you have a something there, right? So persistence and things like this is super important for founders. Do you find yourself saying no for the same reasons often? Yes, yes. Typical no is no traction. There's no product market fit. No. A typical no is that the team has marketeers from the very beginning, which doesn't make any sense. Teams, tech teams should be built by CTO engineers and product specialists. Those are the, the key people that you need to have from the very beginning. You don't need a CMO or a business developer. <laughs> what? Early stage company already needs a business developer? What the hell? No, that for me means that the founder doesn't understand how to build a tech business. A technology businesses businesses should grow based on organic on a, on a very organic way in the very beginning you can use marketing to understand potential but it should be the adoption should be coming in the very beginning through a different route um, because if you're forcing the adoption that means that there's not a problem that you're solving right going back to that so the most typical are those two yeah and and the third one would be when people are not themselves and you and you feel that he's telling me everything I want to hear, he knows the, the, the speech the pitch really well. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear it. You know, I, I, I love I love the outliers, the ones that are different, the ones that are take big risks, that maybe their first time category. You know, I've seen all crazy kind of ideas and companies and founders. Um, I love those. The ones that are changing something meaningful in the life of people. Those are the ones that, whether if it's a fintech and it's democratizing access to financial services, whether if it's a marketplace or it's putting together, you know, boaters and and uh, people that just wants to have a fun day in the water, whatever, whatever. But people that truly is passionate about building that. Well, Laura, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you <laughs> for being short? on Innovation no. <laughs> City. How can people get in touch with you or with Venture City? Yes, of course. So the venture dot, I mean, dot, 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 uh, the venture dot city. 
or Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, easy. We are easy to reach. Um, sometimes we're not that fast responding, but it can be due to so many different factors. Um, but we're always happy to help anyway. Awesome. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. guys. No, thank you. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If you're in Miami, visit us at Venture Cafe on Thursday nights. You can find details at VentureCafeMiami.org and connect with us on social at We Are Slam and Venture Cafe MIA. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fight. This is where we make our dreams.